Hello and welcome to the shop. I get asked on a regular basis, and by regular I mean almost weekly, <laughs> to do a shop tour, to show my turning tools, or to do a video on sharpening. I am not ready to do a video on sharpening right now. Uh, there are some changes that are going to happen in that arena for me, and I'd rather wait until they're all, all finished before I do that. Uh, I thought about doing a shop tour, but I think I'm going to save that for a, a later video, a second video, because the shop tour is a little more general. I'm going to talk about my turning tools, and what it'll let me do is show you the tools that I use and hopefully get into a little more detail about them without letting the video get insanely long. I do not have top of the line, the most expensive, best you can buy tools. I have what I'm going to call working class tools. <laughs> Um, I try to buy decent quality where I can, but it's not always an option for me to buy top of the line. Some of the tools I have are relatively cheap. Uh, as I go through the, the tools, if there are some I have that are nice to have versus need to haves, I'm going to let you know. You don't need this. You can do it this way. Or if there are some that are, you, you can start out turning, but you don't really need that tool to turn with right away. You can wait make a few pins, maybe sell them, and then pick that up later because it's really kind of nice to have, but it's not a necessity. I'm going to try to point those things out to you. I'll give you my opinion on the uh, tools that I have as I show them, and this is getting way too long, so let me stop the monologue and let me get on to showing you my turning tools. The first thing I want to talk about is the first obstacle that you'll face pin turning, and that is you need to cut your blank to size or cut your blank in half to be able to use it. Now, I many times use a bandsaw or a table saw to do that, but not everybody has the luxury of having those tools, and not everybody has the room in their shop for those tools. My favorite tool by far is this little Jorgensen uh, miter saw. Now, don't be fooled by this saw. I did not pay full price. I got this at a rummage sale for $5. And it's my favorite tool because the blade is so absolutely thin, I get minimal kerf, and the less kerf, the better the grain's gonna match up when you put the two pieces back together. This is by far my favorite way to cut acrylic or wood blanks. I've also, in the past, used these little pull saws, and I've even gone as far as to use just a rip saw. The cut that you make does not have to be accurate when you split or size a blank. You're going to insert a tube and you're going to trim it to make it perfectly square. That's where you need to have the accuracy. Cutting it is, do not spend a lot of money on tools to cut if you're just starting out. Get you something like this at a big box store. You can buy a miter box and a, and a, and a saw for 10 to 15 bucks. That's good enough to cut your blanks and get you by until you're ready to spend a little more money on a larger saw. Once your blanks are cut, the next step would be to drill them for tubes. Now, almost every video I do, you'll see me using this drill press and this pin vise. Not everybody has a drill press, so I'm going to show you some alternate methods, and not everybody has a pin vise. This pin vise is a nice to have. You do not need one of these, but if you drill on a press, it will make drilling a lot easier. Let me show you a couple of other methods to drill on a drill press. I've seen a number of turners use these Jorgensen clamps to hold the wood. It gives you a nice grip and it's long enough where you can get a hold on it or even clamp it to your table and then you're able to drill a perpendicular hole right down the center of your blank. Though I do not recommend this method because I'm just not comfortable with it so I wouldn't do it myself, I've seen a number of guys use channel locks to hold their blank to be able to drill it. This method will work, but once again, I do not endorse it because I'm not comfortable doing it. You have to be comfortable that it is safe to do in your own shop. One last method that I have personally used is to take two blocks of wood and to glue them together at a 90 degree angle. Then attach those blocks of wood to some type of a large base. You can probably find all this material in your scrap bin. You lay your blank in the 90 degree Put a clamp on it to hold it in place, and this gives you a nice, sturdy base to be able to drill a perpendicular hole right down the center of your blank. 
The other nice feature about this is if your base is large enough, you can clamp it to your table. I would recommend uh, most of your blanks are half size, maybe not having these pieces of wood quite so tall. I just grabbed what was available, but cutting these in half would give you a much nicer uh, base to hold that blank. Maybe you have a smaller shop and you don't have a drill press or don't want to invest in one. You could purchase a chuck for your lathe and a set of pin jaws. Usually these come separately. And the way they work is you'll install the pin jaws on your chuck. Your blank will slide down right into the pin jaws and you get a nice solid grip. You'll also need a Jacobs chuck for your tailstock. Place your bit in here. And when your lathe is spinning, you bring your tailstock up and you drill right down the center. You're guaranteed to have a perfectly centered hole every time. I get asked often, why don't I use this method? And the reason I don't, you'll learn a little bit more about that when I talk about my lathe, but I have a, an inexpensive lathe and there's quite a bit of play in the tailstock and that play causes me to wallow out the holes and I do not get a nice fit with my tubes. In the future, I hope to purchase a higher quality or a nicer lathe and when I do, I'll probably use this as my preferred method for drilling blanks. If you do not have a drill press, and you do not have a chuck and are not in a position to invest in one at the present time, here's a couple of alternative methods that you might be able to use. These Jorgensen clamps, and there are knockoff brands as well, but they're relatively inexpensive. And if you get yourself one of these to hold your blank perfectly perpendicular, you could then use your standard hand drill and drill right down the center of your blank. I've seen a number of guys also use this method where they'll hold the blank and drill right down the center of it. And the method we talked about with the scrap wood would work as well, just like the Jorgensen clamp. You can clamp it into this little gizmo and go right down the center of it. Now you may not get holes that are as accurate as they would be on a drill press or by drilling on the lathe, but using any of these methods and just taking your time, you'll be able to get a hole down the center of your blank that is good enough to put a tube in and make a pin and you'll be very happy with the end result. Once you've drilled your blank, glued the tube in, and the glue has sufficiently dried, you need to turn your attention to squaring up the ends of the blank so that you get a nice fit against the bushings, number one, and number two, you get a nice fit when you press your pin parts into your blank. I normally use a barrel trimmer, and the way this one works is there's a little hex key there. I loosen that up and it slides off the back of this uh, shaft, and this is a seven millimeter. I've got an eight millimeter, a three eighths, and a 10 millimeter and I can just swap the shafts out to do different size tubes. I normally barrel trim on my drill press using my vise to hold my blank, but quite honestly, any of the methods I talked about for drilling a blank will work for barrel trimming a blank. An alternative to barrel trimming with such an aggressive tool as the barrel trimmer is to use your belt sander. Now this little device here, is a sled that was made for me by a gentleman named Robert Montgomery. And it was made to fit. He took measurements of my uh, belt sander and made it to fit. You can purchase these. I've seen them at Penn State. I don't remember the price. They're not super cheap, but they are very valuable in the shop. The nice thing is, if you're gonna buy a set of barrel trimmers, you can probably buy this for about the same price if you already have your, your um, belt sander. The beauty of this is it is way less aggressive. You simply take your blank, slide it onto the shaft, move it in front of the belt, and you can move it back and forth and twist your blank to get a nice flat edge the same as you would with the barrel trimmer. This is great for blanks that are somewhat punky or soft. The barrel trimmer will just chew them all up. The other thing about this is just like the barrel trimmer had an 8mm and a 3 8 and all these different sizes, this shaft is the same size as your mandrel. And what you can do is take some spare tubes and take some hardwood, glue it on those tubes, and turn them down to 10mm outside dimension, 3 8 outside dimension, 27 64 That way, your tube, whatever size it is, will fit right on here, and you get a nice solid fit so it's not wobbly and you'll be able to sand. What I do is I'll put a larger tube on here and I just put a little downward pressure and keep it against the rod. And that way I'm able to turn tubes with larger diameters than seven millimeters. My primary lathe for turning pins is the Harbor Freight or Central Machine 10 inch by 18 inch mini wood lathe. Now you can get this lathe at Harbor Freight for a little under 200 bucks. So it's a good 
priced lathe and it's really worth $200. It, it's great if you want to try turning, but you're not sure if you're going to like it or not and you don't want to sink a ton of cash. It does have a few issues. One of those issues, and I mentioned earlier, is the tailstock has a lot of play left and right. And that makes it difficult for drilling blanks because as I come in, as you push, if you don't get it exactly in the same orientation it was when you started drilling, you'll drill your hole off at an angle and wallow out your pin blank. A couple other things about the lathe, it is belt driven. So if you want to change your speed, you're reaching in the back of the lathe here and changing the belts. It is not reversible. If you want to reverse a pin blank, what I end up doing is taking it off the mandrel, flipping it around and turning it from the other direction. I do that quite often when I'm sanding because as you use your tool to cut, it'll lay the grain of the wood down uh, as it attempts to cut. And if you flip it around while sanding, your sandpaper will raise that grain up and allow you to uh, remove it. So I'll flip back and forth between grits of sandpaper. Let's talk mandrels. My preference is the mandrel saver mandrel. And that is what I used to use until I bent it. And I needed a mandrel in a pinch. And I happened to have this older mandrel rod. So I chucked it up in my Jacob's chuck. And it worked great. And I've just never replaced it. So I've been using it. And it's, it's never caused an issue. With the older style mandrels, whenever you put a pin blank on your tube, you'll need to keep an ample supply of spare bushings on hand so that you can fill this extra tube up to where the bushings are on the threaded section of the mandrel because that's how you tighten down and lock your blank in place to keep it from slipping. And then there's a dimple in the end of the mandrel that you'll generally bring a live center up to and lock in place. Do not put a lot of pressure here. You just need to snug this. Your, your tightness comes here. That's what holds the blank in place. This just keeps the mandrel from bowing. If you put a lot of pressure here, you will put a bow in your mandrel, and when you pull your blanks off, you'll notice that they are ovaled on the ends. You don't want to do that. A nice alternative, and I mentioned the mandrel saver earlier on, is to use the mandrel saver for the tailstock. Now this is nice. You can see there's a hole all the way through and what that does is this goes into your tailstock and it allows your mandrel to pass all the way through the tailstock. This will allow you to close up on any blank. So if you're turning a single blank for a pin, if you're turning a small blank, you can close right up to it, lock down, and the end of this is very similar to a bushing. So you're pressing against the bushings, not against the blank, not against the mandrel, and you get a very nice tight fit where your blank will not slip. Also with the mandrel saver, there is no chance that you're going to bow the mandrel because the mandrel is passing through the saver. I highly recommend this for your lathe. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you use the mandrel saver mandrel, if you use a standard mandrel, if you use a, a, a jerry-rigged setup like I have, it doesn't matter. This is the part that matters and keeps you from bowing your mandrel. I have not turned an oval out of shape blank since I started using this device. Well worth the money. Let's talk about another important feature of turning, dust collection. I use this little Rockler dust collector. It hooks into a shop vac and basically it takes, your bigger particles are still gonna come out, your chips are gonna still come out towards you. This device will suck up the fine dust and take it into the vac system and help keep it out of your lungs. You want to avoid breathing as much of the wood and acrylic and antler dust as you can because some of that stuff is pretty bad and it's not gonna leave your lungs and it can cause some serious problems later in life. I also use a a mask. I picked this up at uh, one of the big box stores and it's a particle mask for dust particles and I do not remember how fine of a particle it will it will stop but it's a great way when I'm turning things like antler to keep that out of my lungs. You're definitely going to want to use some type of a face shield. Now if you're turning something big like a bowl or, or, or just a big chunk of wood this little piece of plastic isn't going to do you much good but when you're turning pins and you've got these little chips coming off they will get in your eyes they will sting your face 
This will help you. Do not turn without a face shield. I also like to use a set of headphones. And I like to use these because the, these are uh, Lehigh, I believe. And uh, this is a nicer set that my son bought me. I have a less expensive set. They don't need to be expensive. These actually will let you plug your MP3 player in and play music. I like it because if I'm turning for long stretches, I can have a little music going in the background. But when I run the dust collector, you've always got the shop back going. And that loud shop back noise will pierce your ears and give you a headache after a while. So get yourself a nice set of either ear, ear plugs or get yourself a, a set of headphones. Here's where it gets interesting. I have a rather large selection of tools. Many of these tools like these are absolute trash, but I've just not brought myself to get rid of them. Some of the tools are fairly decent. Many of the tools are duplicates. I don't have this many different tools. You do not need this many tools to turn. I just can't stop from picking them up at garage sales when I see them. <laughs> Let me talk about the tools that I use primarily when I turn. I've got five tools that I use the majority of the time. The first of those is this carbide tool. And I don't use this on pins, but I use it on larger items to, to remove large amounts of material. I've got a bedan tool and I use this tool similar to how I use the uh, carbide tool to remove large amounts of material fast. I don't use it on pins as often as I used to. I used to make tenons with it, but now I use some wrenches to do that. And I'll show you those shortly. This is probably my most expensive tool and it wasn't that bad, but you need a good parting tool. And this is a eighth inch parting tool and it, it's amazing. This came out of a little pin turner set from Woodcraft and it's a small skew and I've been known to use this quite often. It's extremely handy for getting into tight places and if you get the hang of how to turn the skew, this is an amazing tool for pin turning because it gives you a finish that really is probably a 220 in regard to sandpaper. It is amazing. My favorite tool and the one that you see me use all the time is this one. It is an extremely long three quarter inch roughing gouge. It's a Benjamin's Best. It is from Penn State. And I like this tool because when I turn with it, I can lock it into my hip and I can hold the tool right here. The other end of the tool will of course be on the tool rest. I can sharpen it to a razor sharp edge and I can use this tool to get right down next to my bushings and turn that blank to where I have an incredible fit. This is my go-to tool probably 85 to 90 percent of the time and I turn the pin from start to finish with this tool. Other tools that I use while turning and I pick these up at Harbor Freight are some wrenches and I grind off the short edge, make it sharp and these make excellent tenon tools if you're making a dowel or you need to turn a tenon on the end of a pin. You get it close to size with your gouge and then you use this to take it down and you get a perfect size every time. Now these are standard which most of the pins I turn require standard tenons, but they also sell, and I think these are six or eight bucks, they also sell a metric set, and you could do the same with that. Most recently, I've gotten into buffing my pins, and I am extremely pleased with the finish that I'm getting from the buffing wheel. I use a little bit of rosin. I put it on the first wheel. This takes all the fine scratches out of the blank, and then after about 20 seconds on this wheel, you move to this wheel for about 10 seconds, and you get a super clean, brilliantly shiny finish. Absolutely enjoying this. Not a necessity, but it's something nice to have later on down the line. Once you finish turning your pin, you're gonna to wanna to clean it. This will take all the oils off of the pin uh, from your hand. It'll take any of the dust off of the pin. And I just used some denatured alcohol. I picked this up at the big box store and uh, it, it, it does a great job of cleaning the blank prior to applying a finish. It also evaporates relatively quickly, so there's not a long wait time before you go to your finishing step. Finishing your pins. <laughs> this is a tough one. I cannot tell you the best way to finish your pins. All I can tell you is the progression that I went through, and hopefully you'll find somewhere in between that works well for you. My suggestion is try a number of different things until you find what works well in your shop. I started off with using uh, crystal coat on my pins, hut crystal coat. It is a friction polish. 
and then I would follow it up with hut white and then hut brown wax. And this provides a wonderful finish. However, six months to a year down the road, your pen is going to look kind of dingy and grungy and dirty because this doesn't provide long-term protection. I recommend this finish for things like Christmas ornaments or candle holders that aren't going to be held on a daily basis. For a pen where you've got the oils in your hands and, you know, the, you, you, and the dirts, you're going to want something that's going to provide a little better finish. I then moved on to what they call Triple E Ultra Shine. After you sand, you would rub some of this in, work it in really well, polish it off, and then a shell of wax. And I really love the finish. I, it's comparable to this, maybe a tiny bit better. Uh, I really liked it. Um, but once again, six months, a year down the road, your pen is going to look a little dingy. I then moved on to using a cyanoacrylate, a thin and a medium. And I really love PSI's thin, and I really love stick fast medium. These are my preferences. There are, there are multiple glues out there, and you will find one that you really like. These are just the ones I like. And I really enjoy stick fast's activator. Although I try to use this as infrequently as possible because it can cause some blemishes in the finish. When using this, I haven't talked about micro mesh yet. I'll get there in a minute. But after you put the CA finish, you want to micro mesh to smooth it out and polish it up and give it a nice shine. Once it's shiny, to take the super fine scratches out and to get it looking absolutely beautiful. Um, I started out with a one step polish, which is an acrylic polish. And I use this on all my acrylic blanks. I then moved to the Hut Ultra Gloss, which I liked a little better. Um, I thought it gave me a better performance. And recently I've been using Plastex Polish, someone told me about. I got it very cheap. This stuff is like 11 bucks. This stuff is maybe three or four. And uh, it's been doing as well as the Ultra Gloss, if not better, it's been doing a wonderful job. The plastic polishes also do a great job of putting a coating on the outside of the pen uh, like a waxy coating. And in you, if you use CA, it is going to, I've got pens that are five years old that look as good as they did the day I turned them. The CA is not affected by oils in your hands, dirt in the environment, it stays beautiful. So this is my preferred method. It's not the only way to do it. You need to find one that works well for you. For sanding your blank, you're gonna want a good selection of sandpaper. I purchased a Pen Turner's sanding pack, which came with 150, 240, 320, 400, and 600. I work through the grits, I get a very nice finish. I've also in the past used this, I call it Abronet, and I've got all of the, well not all, I've got uh, about the same number of grits, I think I have the first four of Abronet, and it does a nice job, and it lasts quite a bit longer than standard sandpaper. However, bear in mind, it, it is a little bit more aggressive, um, so I, if you can get a good finishing cut, you don't need, or I don't personally feel like I need that level of aggressiveness. So I hang on to it for rougher woods uh, where I don't get as nice of a finish. The real magic makers are these. I call them micro mesh pads. They're actually PSI's pin finishing pads. Micro mesh is a brand all to itself uh, and they are color coded and you simply flip through them by the colors and you can get a fantastic finish. I have used these dry on wood to get a super smooth finish. I prefer to use them wet. They are wonderful for acrylic. I normally don't sand wood with these uh, particular pads unless it is part of a hybrid blank where it's part acrylic, part wood, and I'm bringing up the shine on the acrylic. Then I'll, sign, I'll shine the wood with them as well. Um, I prefer to use them wet on acrylics or after I have applied my CA finish and it's sufficiently dried, I'll run through the pads to level out the finish, clean it up, and bring it to a brilliant shine. Once you've finished sanding and polishing your pen, you're ready to assemble it into, the, into a pen kit. A pen press is nice to have. This is not a necessity. I see many people who will just use a pistol grip clamp, or I've even seen some people who will use a bench vise to press their pens together. Also, if you can get a hold of some HDPE, and if you are into Peter Brown's videos at all, he shows you how to melt it down from milk jugs. You could take a piece of HDPE on your headstock, tailstock of your lathe, drill a hole in it, and you can press these together, these pins together, actually on your lathe using the tailstock crank handle to apply the pressure to seat your pieces. Here's some additional tools that are nice to look at. Don't buy these right up front but down the road you are going to mess up a blank. We all do 
And these are wonderful because these vice grips allow you to grip a blank and it's rubber tipped so it will not damage your blank. These punches allow you to knock the parts out of your blank. So let's say you press the nib into the wrong end of a blank. You can use one of these punches and knock it out and then press it in the opposite end. Definitely worth that into your arsenal, but wait until later on down the line. Just hang on to those blanks and uh, you can always knock them apart later. Unless you're using carbide, you're gonna need some way to sharpen your tools. I use this Wolverine sharpening system. It has this pocket that allows me to move it in or out to the length of the tool and I can lay my tool against the wheel to sharpen it. It also has this nice little platform and there are a couple of other attachments. I have this Veragrind attachment for bowl gouges and it sets in the pocket and lets you rock the bowl gouge back and forth to create that swept back cut. And I've also got this attachment, which is for sharpening skews. I'm not gonna talk about how this works today because this is a high speed grinder. I have recently purchased a low speed grinder and I'm gonna take this setup apart and put it back together with the low speed grinder. Also, I've purchased a CBN wheel, which is a wheel that builds very little heat. It never gets, the, gets, gets cupped out because your, your uh, stone wheels will cup out and you'll have to flatten them periodically. Uh, what I'm going to do is hold off until I get the new grinder set up, get the CBN wheel on here, and then I'll talk about sharpening. This is not a necessity. If you, you can sharpen by hand. If you have a grinder, you can build the pocket tool to be able to sharpen. There are many videos out there to do that. But if you do not have carbide, you are going to have, have some way to keep your tools sharp because a sharp tool works better and a dull tool will catch more often and you'll blow a lot more blanks apart. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I had a good time making it. I hope I said everything I needed to say. <laughs> I tried to give uh, alternatives where I could. Uh, I tried to let you know what's nice to have and need to have. This is not a hobby where you buy a lathe, buy a tool and turn a pin. There are so many variations and everybody has an opinion. This is the way to go. Do it this way. It only works this way. And that's not true. You need to experiment a little bit, be safe about it, but experiment and find what works well in your shop. If it works in your shop and you get a wonderful result, that's the right way to do it. But always be open-minded and listen because other turners will tell you things and you can use some of their ideas to make your turning better. Thanks for hanging out with me today. I appreciate you joining me in the shop. I want you to know that you are always welcome in my shop. Come back and see me again real soon. Have a great evening, everybody.